Oh, Michael. Hello. Hi, Nate. Hello. Michael, I can't hear you. We had this problem before. Okay, I'm doing old school. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hey. <laughs> Watch your speakers. I had this problem earlier. Not sure why. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Chris, thank you for joining us. Sure, absolutely. Isaac, you there? There you are. Cool. Great. Well, it's exactly five. So why don't I call us to order? And I think Nate, you're taking minutes tonight? Cool. And Isaac, I think you are up next for June, for June, for minutes. Sound cool? Chris, you don't have to take minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it doesn't look like we have public comments. Um, maybe someone will pop in, but um, so how about we proceed? Does that sound good to everybody? Cool. Um, so Chris was willing to come back and talk to us. And I think we had two things we wanted to talk to him about. One was getting some clarification on the stretch code um, requirements for buildings based on the chart that we looked at. So when we go back to town meeting, we'll be super clear about that. And then I think once we figured that one out, we can sort of go into the climate leaders program and get a little more information since um, Chris, that was our hope to take a first step. Um, but I think I, I told you we didn't we didn't get there because we forgot to do a public hearing, which um, we could discuss. But the intent is there, right? So, yeah. Last time we last time we talked, um, I thought you guys were mulling things over and were looking for a public hearing. And when I heard it went to town meeting, I went, "Oh, wow!" <laughs> yeah, it's that was fast. <laughs> It, you know, it probably could have gone that way. We just, we have a different relationship with the select board, which we're going to clarify in next week. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, so it wasn't clear who was calling the public hearing. And as a result, it sort of fell in the gap and no one did it. So that was gotcha. sort of, no one caught that. Um, so I'm just going to share the graphic that I've got. Um, that's not the good one. Let me unshare that and do a better one. Um, oh, that was yep. Yeah, look forward to you guys saying you have some improvements to our presentation slide. Yeah, I'm just gonna get this over here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I can now share. There we go. Can you all see that? No. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So, Chris, we took this from the PowerPoint that you shared with us when you did the presentation. Yep. And then we, we included it as a handout um, that we were going to bring to town meeting, but we had a meeting to sort of prep for town meeting and we had a conversation and we just wanted to get clear one on the requirements that then I think also our recommendations of you know how to make it a little less confusing because you know we had four good brains trying to clear clarify it. It seemed like that was an indicator that maybe it should be organized differently. So 
I'll take a stab at what I understand, and then you all could just jump in, and then we can let Chris clarify. But I think, you know, what's clear is um, all all electric homes and home additions and historic existing homes. Well, all electric homes, the top line, and home additions and alterations are the same. Um, and I think what we wanted to get clear on is the mixed fuel new home part. Um, Cause the wording seemed a little unclear. Like the, the blue is straightforward. It's really the green um, in terms of the solar PV wiring for electrification. Um, and did, am I expressing that right, you guys? Is that where the confusion was? Yeah, you know, did you wanna? Because I think what we took away was in, so this is the question, Chris. It seemed like you didn't have to do anything beyond wiring um, for the blue. You know, so you had to, you sort of, if you're going to do a new home, you had to have it wired and you had to have it prepared. But with the green, it says solar PV plus wiring for electrification. Um, is there any instance in there where you have to actually do the panels or is it never panels? That was sort of the question. Oh, no, there, there is. The solar PV means panels. So that's, so solar PV plus wiring for electrification. So additional electrification, is that? So there are two, there are two different things. Um, let me describe what wiring for electrification means. Um, I started sounding like that might, okay. So all electric homes will have 100% you know, electric. So the gas, you know, there, there won't be a gas stove. There won't be a gas hot water system. There won't be a gas dryer. Uh, there won't be a wood stove, um, stuff like that. So um, if you know, the mixed fuel new home You've got at least one of those. So you've got some kind of combustion on site that makes you a mixed fuel new home. And for most appliances that that refers to, except for the wood stove, which has got no substitute besides a wood stove. Um, um, so if you put in a gas range or if you put in a gas dryer or a gas hot water system, then you need to wire, you need to provide, you know, whatever. Um, electrical wiring is needed to bring a plug to that spot so that when someone is ready to, to replace that unit with an all electric unit, which we are thinking they will be at some point in the future, um, you know, instead of having a gas range, you're going to have an electric range. Instead of having a, a, a gas dryer, you're going to have an electric dryer. Um, and, and so you don't have to tear the house apart in order to make that move. You just have to run the wiring put a plug there where that existing appliance is that's now has some kind of combustion. And that's what it, that's what it means. It's wiring for electrification. So let me, let me, I'll just jump in for a sec. So just when you said you don't have to pair, tear the house apart, it seems like the wiring only shows up in the mixed fuel new homes. So that would be built, like you would build in say, a connection for a gas stove and you'd put a plug next to it. Is that? Yep. You know? Right. And this is and this is all new homes. The specialized yeah. code only addresses new homes. Right. So when you were saying you didn't have to pull the, the house apart, it that was just sort of a throwaway statement. You didn't really mean it. Uh no, it's it means like so you know you build a, if you built a house right now to this to the stretch code and it's right. much and 15 years from now, someone wants to replace that uh, uh, gas dryer with an electric dryer. They're going to have to run wires. They're going to have to open up walls. They're going to have to have the electric panel. You know, whatever it takes, they're going to have to run wires. And it's going to be a big hindrance to keeping someone from actually making that swap to an all electric system. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you meant ripping it, ripping it apart in the future, not got it. Okay. Right. That makes it okay. okay. There we go. There's a clarification. Yes. You, it, so, what what you are doing is you are taking on some of the cost early on, but you're taking it on in a way that minimizes that cost because it's not that expensive to run a line. Although I'm 
sure I'll have some someone in the audience might argue with with, with that. <laughs> there it is a, it is a certain expense, but it's a lot less expense than having to open up walls and try to run wiring um, once the house has been finished and been used for fifteen years. <laughs> and it's not a deficit to resale of the house. No, it certainly shouldn't be. You you forestalled any objection to a sale. Right. And so it would be accurate to say to the town meeting or to a public hearing that if you're building a new home and you are wed to the idea of gas or oil or something like that, you can still build it. You just have to put a plug for people who want to electrify that particular appliance in the future. Yes. Well said. Okay. Right. I have a question about um, the kind of the middle option, like the 4,000 square feet and over, um, it says two net zero, but if that net zero brings the, the, the builder or the person over like the, the net metering cap, like, is there any play there? Yeah, it's not meant to be an impossible situation to reach. Um, I'll say for the PV in general, if you've got a shaded site, then we're not gonna require you to put a PV array in or we're not gonna require you to you know, chop down a tree um, to get it. Um, the next slide in my uh, presentation would have shown uh, the requirements for PV. And the exceptions. Uh, but Yeah, but, but the, the point is though, um, you know, if you've got space and your house is facing the right way and it's possible to do this, then you, you are to put enough wiring in to get, get to net zero. Hey, Isaac. Yeah. Are you on hold? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, is it, so the wire for electrification, is everyone clear on that one? That was very helpful. Cool. So I think the other place was just sort of the requirement to actually put panels on. And it seems like from reading this, if you have a mixed fuel new home, and it's either 4,000 square feet or under or over, you've got to put solar panels. And to Isaac's point, it's either a minimum of, of 4KW or two net zero. Um, does that, is that those first two lines, that's accurate, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the third one would be the mixed fuel new home of any size that's a passive house option. Then all you have to do is the electrification. You don't have to put, so if you're building a passive house, you don't have to put panels on it. Is right. I guess the, okay. Right, yep. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent um sure myself why, because I'm I'm less familiar with the passive house uh pathway. But I understand passive house is 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 really quite stringent. Um hmm. they're they're very, very efficient houses. Um probably goes beyond you know the hers trading that we're requiring, but they're they're um they're judged and rated in a different way. It's um it's a different pathway to follow. And the code developers felt it was it was fine to to bring it to this point and not have not have to require PV there because it's uh, such a good tight house. Okay. So, is this making sense to everybody? If if we got up and explained to everyone, feeling comfortable at this point. So I think my only peanut gallery suggestion, Chris, is like in my brain, I sort of think about in columns of like if you had a column about solar panels and you had a column for wire and electrician and it was a check mark because oh, really, you're sort of doing double duty in these cells where you're doing two different things yep and it's not that it's unexplainable because you obviously just explained it but i think as a, as a for people trying to get a gauge of like what i'm committing to and what i have to do that might be a, and, and we might maybe we'll create something from that but right so since just um i'll play a little devil's advocate here um, looking, looking at the table because it's worth worth critiquing. Uh, the columns at the moment are, uh, you know, the, or at least the the two right hand columns are different codes. Yeah. So would it also work if you took 
Um, you know, the row under 4,000 square feet. Then you have HERS 42. And then the next column is broken into two rows. Yeah. Okay. So breaking it out so that they're actually separate items. Yeah. I think I think so. And I would I think I would be, you know, you got a little bit little, little bit of a wiggle room in terms of characters, but being ex, you know, solar PV, yeah, I think having two rows makes sense because when at least when I was reading it, we had a conversation. Are you wiring for solar or do you have to build solar? Like that was the question. Yeah. Was... Right. Right. I can understand that. Because the stretch code actually does require. Oh, boy, it's been a while since I've actually talked about the stretch code because <laughs> I've been talking so much about the specialized code. Um, the stretch code does does require electrification. I mean, does require wiring, say, for an EV charger. Mm -hmm. And it does require not wiring, but it requires um, running conduit space, basically knowing how you're going to run the wiring for a PV array um, and, and building that in. And, and, and so there is some some kind of wiring requirement under the stretch code so i could see where people could get confused okay. yeah gail um i would suggest just splitting those two cells the the green solar pv split horizontally so you don't add yeah. rows clear across so it's no clear. no, no I, I agree i agree that's what i was saying yes yeah, just, okay. the, just the green cell would be broken into two rows correct yeah. uh, i would yeah. suggest also an asterisk Behind the uh, solar PV that goes to C exceptions. Okay. And that would be the next slide. Correct. Right. And do you guys have the right next slide there? We Not for, we didn't do it, but I think for our next one. I remember it though. It was it was very clear about the shading. Yep. Right. And that's what you're referring to, right, Gail? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and maybe just we so that it doesn't look at re at reading this chart alone, it doesn't look like you are demanding or requiring yep. solar PV panels. Yep. Without exception, that's all. Well, that's great. I'd, oh. also re I'd also recommend just like if if we weren't around to explain it, and somebody was just looking at this, maybe have a, a, at the bottom of the a bottom of the slide just have a definition of what wiring for electrification means. Um, cause that could be, you know, like there was some confusion on that. Cool. And I think whether Chris does it or we do it, we should definitely, I mean, the more, cause my sense is if we have a public hearing, you know, like currently Chris, this handout was on the webpage for ECAC in advance of town meeting. Mm -hmm. So I would assume that in advance of a public hearing and then subsequent town meeting, we would post this. So people are going to be looking at it without the benefit of us around to, yep. to answer the questions at the beginning. So the more it's sort of a one-shop thing, they can look at it, try to understand it, and then come to the meeting prepared as opposed mm -hmm. to feeling outraged or confused. Um, that's probably a good thing. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. This was helpful. Okay. And I can I can work with you to kind of come up with a different table um, offline yeah, that would, outside the meeting. That would be great. A good model of municipal and state collaboration. I there we it. go. Right. <laughs> so Can you take this down. I I wrote some stuff down. Yeah. yeah thank so, you. Yeah, and uh, I think we'll we'll be in better shape next time. So I think the you know we did have a conversation. Is it maybe March before town meeting? You know, and our takeaway was we we wanted to do the stretch code because that seemed like it was the first step on the pathway to the climate leadership program. Um, specialized so, code. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And so if okay. we couldn't do that, like that would be the first step and then we'll sort of go from there. But I think now since we're, you know, we got support from the select board to go forward, we voted to go forward with the, the specialized code. So it's just a matter of bringing it to town meeting. So it seems like a good opportunity just to sort of talk through a little bit more about the climate leadership and hear sure. anything that you think would be worth sharing with us as we think about that. Yeah, I absolutely. Um, I could pull up some slides and kind of go. Yeah, I'm going to take this down for you. Without you know. it, without it being a presentation. Perfect. Okay. Whatever, whatever works. Let's see. Do I have? Oh, I need to. 
Okay, I'm starting with a slideshow that I gave to Deerfield, but that's because I, I gave it to Ashfield afterwards, you know, before that. Let's see. Yeah. Here we go. We're all in it together. Okay, so let me, um, okay, uh, sure. Real quickly, I'll give you a little background. It might be useful. The old, you know, Green Communities Program was formed at a time when the, the push, um, uh, when the Global Warming Solutions Act back in 2008, you know, the push was really wrapped around energy efficiency. So if you were going to replace a gas a gas boiler, you made sure you put in a condensing gas boiler, say, um, was the idea, you know, efficiency. But since then, things have shifted um, and they've shifted quite a bit. So to the point where now in 2021, the Climate Act, when that was signed, where we had net zero emissions requirements by 2050, uh, the state has a requirement to be net zero by 2050. Um, the shift has now been greenhouse gas reductions. So the um, uh, Climate Leaders Communities Program has a chance of actually making that shift. Kind of, it, it's, it's aimed more towards that, where Green Communities Program was more designed for energy efficiency, then it kind of shifted towards greenhouse gas reductions. And that's based on policies uh, that the state's implemented, and it's based on just what's happening because of those policies. Mass Save is getting more that way. State incentives are beginning getting that you know more that way, um, um, on and on. Okay, so now let's get to uh, climate leaders communities. These are the basic requirements to get certified. So you must be an existing green community in good standing. Um, did you guys send in your annual report this last year? <laughs> if not, <laughs> it's I think that's our town administrator who does it, right, Gail? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and and you're not uh, backing out of any of the other policies and stuff that you've adopted as a green community. So establish and maintain a local committee, which would be you guys. Um, the, the town has to commit to a municipal decarbonization by 2050. This is the one thing that has to go to town meeting. But besides, I guess besides the specialized stretch code. Um, actually, is that true? No, the decarbonization could be adopted by the executive as well. Could be the board of selectmen, um, I believe. But I think there's towns that are, are bringing it to town meeting. And is that is there? A, so one of the things we got stuck on with town meeting, which we found out after the fact, was we actually there was like a paragraph that we brought to to put on the warrant, and then what was pointed out to us is. You know, we need basically we need to have a bylaw that would be voted on and approved. And so, is there an existing? It says formulate roadmap. Is there a document that we would then have the select board be approving? Is it a so? Like, um, so there's actually two things here, and I I have a problem with this slide myself because that third bullet point should really be two different bullet points. There should be an extra line in here. Okay. There, Commit to municipal decarbonization by 2050, and that's a resolution. Yeah, right. Stop. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So it could be done, and it's. And I mean, towns are bringing it to town meeting. Although I don't think they have to. It could be, um, you know, it could be in a master plan, um, per se. Um, but it's a, but it's a policy to, a resolution uh, to basically stop burning fossil fuels for municipal operations, municipal operations, not citywide, not townwide, um, by 2050. That's basically in a nutshell what you're asking for that to be. And then formulate a roadmap for implementation. That's a, that's a different piece. The consequence, yeah. Yeah, and that one is really more of a planning tool. There's no, um, uh, um, there's no requirement to it. There's no um, punishment for not doing it. Um, you'll see as I go on, you're going to be expected to up Update it over time. It's really more of a planning tool to help you kind of move and actually do it. Um, so then there's a zero emission vehicle first vehicle policy, uh, which also has to go to town meeting. 
Um, and I've got a slide on that later on. Uh, I'll show you what the details are. And this, I'm adopting the specialized stretch code. So those are the requirements for certification. Okay. Any questions about that before? I have more details to go into. So, Great. but, um, okay. Um, unlike the Green Communities Program, uh, there you, instead of making sure that you're um, applying everything once a year through your annual report, this one you're gonna, you're gonna have to um, get recertified every three years. So that basically is demonstrate you're still meeting all the certification requirements. Update your decarbonization roadmap. That's an op opportunity to update that planning tool. And then implement one community engagement climate leader best practice. And this one is really broad. You know, you can bring ideas to us and we'll see whether or not we agree with them. They'll very often will be community facing instead of municipal facing. Whereas everything else is all to do with municipal operations. This one, could you know have to do with um, with going out? A solarized program would be a good example. Putting in some kind of a um, complete streets policy um, could be a good example. Um, and I actually have some more examples later on. But so it's a three-year recertification process. And then um, uh, to help you do all this and to help you kind of reach all those goals, you're still a green community. Um, when you become green communities leaders status, you still are a green community. You still get the grants, uh, competitive grant opportunities. But currently, as a green community, they're limited to what we put out in the pond. Um, and well, climate leaders communities, they're going to have a wider array of things they can apply for. Solar PV is a good example. I've heard um, a lot of communities, you know, mention that. I've heard people, staff at DOER, mention this often. So right now. We won't, so we, you know, Green Communities Competitive Grant won't fund um, a solar array on a municipal building. But if you become a climate leader community, that could become something that you actually apply for. Uh, climate um, Green Communities Program, you know, with the exception of the decarbonization piece, which is up to a half a million dollars, it quite frankly is, you know, the $225,000 um, cap that we have on an annual level, those, those aren't gonna be the biggest projects. Um, so we also recognize that to become a climate leader, you're going to need, you're going to end up um, in cases where you're going to need to put a bunch of money in right away. So you might have to put a, a bunch of weatherization and some improvements in the building and do the you know ventilation system just to get it ready for an electrification of some kind. And those numbers are going to add up. So the climate leader accelerator grant is another pot of money. And I'm hearing this pot of money is going to be like seven, you know, three quarters of a million is a minimum. And it's going to be for larger projects. Um, so that, if you're a climate leader community, there'll be a second grant opportunity. Chris, can I just stop you there for a sec? Sure, absolutely. So, like one of the places, so we're an MVP community and we're a smart streets community. Um, so we've got those things. I feel like we've been stymied in MVP. So I wrote the MVP plan. I wrote this, this smart streets, you know, plan or policy. Um, so we got the MVP planning grant to do that. And then we have our long list of priorities and we've, you know, met with the select board and we've discussed them and we went over them. And we, among several other things, what we wanted to do is put solar on the five municipal buildings. And so in order to do that, you know, because it would mostly be funded by the town, we had a, um, we wanted to get numbers to figure out, okay, because some, you know, there is some solar, um, in different parts of the buildings and they're all laid out differently. So you sort of have to have a, a strategy for how you would design this. So it was net zero across all five buildings. Um, last year, I think it was, um, I'm forgetting his name, but our regional rep for MVP said basically that this- Andrew? Yeah, Andrew, right. Okay. Andrew yeah. said, you know, told Becky and I, they were no longer paying for consultant reports to spec out designs for municipal solar. So, you know, even if the town wanted to pay everything, you know, for a project, um, but in order to do it at a town meeting, you actually have to have numbers and research and, you know, things in black and white, we couldn't get that. So I'm wondering, you know, and it changed. It sounds like, you know, the MVP action grants evolved over time um, to that position. You know, Andrew was saying that they started out paying for those reports and then they saw the municipalities weren't actually building it. 
So they, I guess they decided it was a waste of money. So I know you can't predict the future, but um, my sense is many of these programs start out small and then more towns grow you know, into them. And all of a sudden the number of municipalities participating is bigger and the, it gets more competitive and probably more stringent. So um, are some of these things sort of at the DOER regulatory level or are some of them built in statutorily that they're gonna pay for things? You know, so. Hmm. As far as I know, they're not statutory, they're not the specifics. Okay. Yes, DOER, DOER's prerogative, it has to go up the chain, you know, it has to be approved. Right. So it could be in five years. Get... Right. So in five years, for example, when there's a lot more communities in and things, and you guys have learned stuff, some of what could be paid for might change depending on the lessons learned at DOER. Um, yeah, certainly based on lesson learned. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I will say, um, I, you know, I kind of look at the climate leaders communities program, uh, as both it's helping you become leaders, but it's also asking you to be leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and I say that because, you know, there is uncertainty going forward. There's uncertainty in where the mass save program is going to go. There's uncertainty in where, you know, grants are going to go. Um, and so in a way, uh, it's requiring communities to say, this is serious. Climate change is serious. We need to, um, you know, we need to drastically change how we're heating or cooling our buildings, running things. Um, and we trust that the state's going to be there because they think so too. Uh, so it takes a, a little leap of faith and a little leadership to get out there and say, we're doing this. We're going to commit to it. And it's, it's both a combination of um, you know, taking the leadership, but also uh, trusting that the support will be there, uh, whether it's federal grants and uh, tax breaks, state uh, grants, um, state um, legislation. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of why it's called a leadership program. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Sure, that's okay. No, I'm, I'm, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I come. I think I come to that because working from Northampton, working with Northampton, um, uh, you know, the mayor back when I was there, David Narkowitz, he made a net zero decarbonization commitment by 2050. And you know, with me giving some advice and stuff, and I was like, okay, we can't do this without the state doing their part. Uh, and you know, so with that piece of trust, are you willing to step ahead and be a leader? And, you know, that, that's kind of the where, where things stand. And so, cool. yeah. Yeah, you, know, you had a question or a comment? Uh, it was to go back to the point that you made uh, a moment ago, and that is about the um, consulting or, or figuring out how to go about it. So we had the energy audit two years ago, and we've now done all the things, I believe we've done all the things that were required so our next step would be to make one of these steps on your slide. But to make the proper application, we have to have somebody tell us exactly the details of what needs to be done, the costs, blah, 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 to be able to apply for the grant. And that hits a snag. Okay, so um, there's the meta grants, municipal energy technical assistance grants, that you could you could go for that. Uh, energy efficiency conservation block grants for small communities, all, all the larger communities over 35,000, they got a formula grant. Um, these aren't big grants, but all the smaller communities, the EECBG uh, grants are going to allow for you to apply for some kind of technical assistance if you want. So those are, there's two places where you may be able to get. What was that one um, called? The energy efficiency what? Energy efficiency conservation block grant. And these are DOER? Um, DOER is dispersing it, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for the small communities. It's a federal grant. Mm -hmm. ah. um, it came out once quite a while ago. It doesn't come out every year. You know, every once in a while it kind of pops up through legislation, I guess. And this one's a lot smaller than last time it, it happened. So, um, um, and that's about to come out. 
uh, keep an eye out. You guys should be on the e blast, the email blast for the notices for green communities. It'll yeah. be it'll be described. Uh, you can always go up on combis, do a search on D O E R, and then start looking through the offerings to see if it's up there already, because that's where it'll be published. Cool. Okay. And the first one, I remember. I think it was the secretary. I think it was the secretary spoke at the UMass Solar Forum and mentioned those grants. And I looked into it, and there was some reason that it, we couldn't do it, or I forget what the issue was. But at, at the like moment, it's once a, at the moment it's once a year, and they're kind of in the middle of having just offered some, and they're in, so it's just going to be a little while before it comes back around again. Okay, what are those called again? Uh, um, Municipal Energy Technical Assistance, or META. Meta. Okay. And there is talk inside DOER of, of uh, having that come out um, uh, bi week, bi biannually. So two every two, hmm. two times a year. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're right. Because I, I do agree with you that municipalities need need the technical assistance side. What would we need then, to have the, in, in place to be able to make an application? I mean, it, I think there might be a third way too, but I'm not positive about this. But, you know, homeowners and businesses just go, go to a developer and developers are often willing to come out and give them lots of advice for free. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and will kind of rough things out for them. Yeah, so, Gail tried that. Who, who tried that? Gail did. Okay. No good? Um basically said you need to know what your town intentions and plans are for these buildings. We were talking about putting solar on top of municipal okay. buildings or adjacent to municipal buildings. Yep. Um, we've got forest land, we got wetlands. And old <laughs> building roofs. <laughs> um, right. And so there's, they were saying that because they wanted to make sure that you weren't going to put in a PV rate and take away your building? Say it again, please. So they wanted to make sure that you knew what you were going to use your building for. Oh, I see. If it's a 20-year-old roof, you don't want to put a new solar no. yes. panel on. So what is the plan? What, what's the capital plan for this building? Is it going to be replaced? Is it going to be yes. burned up? Whatever. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. And yeah. He, he did point out that there are consultants, project consultants who would come and analyze the structures, but they're going to ask the same questions. Yep. So, right. so he advised us to go to our capital planning and our buildings committee first. See what's yeah. on the agenda, if there's anything on the agenda, or if anybody's even thinking that far ahead. Right. Or if you can get one of them to give you a list of what, what what requirements does the building have to meet, you know, and go to your um, capital improvements committee and say, when are these buildings going to meet all these requirements? Right. <laughs> Structurally sound, new roof, right. um, facing the right direction, have some side area for ground mounted solar. One notion was to have a joint meeting between capital planning and the buildings committee and pose it in both directions at once. Yep. And have them talk to each other in, with our eyes and ears. Right. I think I think one of the challenges is like even if we had that meeting, very quickly into a meeting like that, someone would say, Well, how much what what's what's the general cost that we're looking at if we were going to do this? Yeah. And who so knows? We think we, we you don't even have a general cost. And so it's sort of there's a desire for us to move forward, but everyone's very cognizant of being responsible with municipal money, you know, so they want to figure out like, okay, how do you, how do you strike that balance? How do we even have a conversation? And there's nothing to grab hold on, um, you know. So okay, even so I, I, I disagree though. I think that you have to talk about feasibility first. Is this building well, even possible is it does it make even sense to to question this particular building and to get I mean, a get, structural question and to get a general price um you know you used to be able to go up to mass clean energy center 
which was in charge of giving all the subsidies. And, you know, uh, and you used to be able to get a spreadsheet of, of every installed PV array that had, that received the Mass CEC subsidy of some kind. Oh, and wow. you got to see the dollar per watt. Um, so there, there is a, a, there probably is a basic dollar per watt. And you could probably ask solar installers, they would know it. Mass CEC would probably be, you know, be able to find, get you that, that number. And then if you knew the, the size of the array that you needed, you could, you know, rough out what the cost would be. And then you could, um, you know, then you would want to have a solar installer uh, help you through the SMART program. Uh, and also you could then count on getting the 30% tax return or, or your direct pay federal tax uh, rate, which is now possible through the Inflation Reduction Act. But you could, you know, even without those subsidies, you could say, "Here's the here's the price that's going to be." Right. And with PV, um, I would advise you also look at what the payback would then be, because particularly with the tax credits, thirty percent tax credits, and the smart program buy down, um, PVs are they pay for themselves. Uh, you know, whether it's seven years or twelve years, um, it's going to be within the lifetime of the array. Right. It's going to pay for itself. Right. So it's really an investment, which is, you know, one of the other reasons I, I, I feel really comfortable pushing this specialized code. If it says you have to put a PV array on, people say, well, that's going to cost you more money. I say, well, yeah. it's actually going to make you money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Over enough time, it's going to make you money. Um, uh, it's going to save you money on the rest of the cost. So I, I think you can rough out some numbers. Uh, we have calculated... Um, how to well we figured out how to calculate uh the kilowattage we would need to get a net zero across the municipal buildings okay and then even project increased use you know up that ante somewhat and if you, and if you say that there's a watt dollar out there then that'll give us a rough ballpark. yeah it's, there's definitely i mean it used to be like four dollars a watt and then there's going to be a difference between a commercial um array which okay. tends to be smaller Right. Uh, and a residential, which tends to be higher. Um, but I think it's probably way down below $4 a watt now. And roof mounted versus now. ground mounted. Yes. Yep. Right. And I, I, don't, I don't know who to call at Mass CEC. Because I'm, I'm not that familiar with the, but. Um, Chris, I had a question. I sure. think. The, I think there's kind of a, kind of a, like a, a spiral that you get stuck into where, you know, in order to get, you know, these grants to, to get net neutrality uh, or net zero um, electrical, like PV solar on, on roofs, you know, you have to have the infrastructure or the availability, right? So Gail was saying, you know, we, we've got trees and wetlands and, and all that stuff. So ground mounted is not necessarily an option and then we have you know we have older buildings that you know might not be able to structurally support a, a solar array or meet the requirements for a uh, you know solar array do you are you aware of any fundings or grants available to get through to that next step right to be able to get the building up to mm -hmm. to code for having the the solar array put on to be able to then apply for the grant to be able to um, get the solar put on. Right. No, I, I don't offhand. Okay. I didn't know if there was any support available that way. Yeah. But Chris, is that what you referred to earlier when you said go the, to your capital planning and building committee and, and tell them what this building has to be like, a roof stress that'll take X pounds or whatever and say do it right i think the town would have to prepare the buildings because there there is um there is an argument to me and and actually the this kind of gets back to the climate leaders communities program and the whole decarbonization by 2050 um there's a lot there where you're actually riding on the state driving down the greenhouse gas emissions from the electric sector. So you don't necessarily have to have the PV array on your building. If you can, if it works, that's great. But 
if it's really expensive and hard to do, then you know by 2050, the state is committing to have the greenhouse gas emissions. Let me see if I can actually take a few more. Oops, that's not it. Um, did I miss? Oh, maybe I, I shrank this a little bit. Oops. Okay, I'm going to find a different. Suppose that we were to buy into a community, oh, a sudden array that's in the next town over on top of Walmart or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would that count for our town in, in, in this array of possibilities? Um, okay, here, this is a better- It's not topic. our roofs in our geographic town, but we're right. buying an array or subscribing to an array that's nearby. Yeah, it's all kind of, there's a little bit of uh, magic or um, <laughs> just, uh, I'm gonna switch to a different presentation. All right. So you guys see a new a new presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So just um. So the climate. I'm going to actually digress us back to the climate leaders communities uh, program, where you know you're looking for that roadmap. You're looking for you know to. Decarbonize by 2050, municipal operations. How do you do that? Um, uh, and we're not, you know, that roadmap, making that roadmap is not really going to be looking at putting PV arrays in. Um, because um, there's many ways you can actually say you've got clean energy. Uh, one of them is put a PV array right on the building, but then if you actually take advantage of the SMART program, Quite frankly, the utilities are then going to be using that those numbers. They're going to say that's their PV array. Yeah. As far as clean energy goes, um, and if you um, if you buy net metering from an array in a different community, um, they're probably doing their smart metering stuff, and you're yeah. buying what yeah. you're what you're doing is you're buying a discounted price on electricity. So we don't uh, get credit for that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So all together, you're you're. The, the state is driving down greenhouse gas emissions. So the way it works, say, right, it, we'll, we'll use an appliance here as an example. So on the, the left the, the left three columns, if you want to call them those, all, are all fossil fuels. Um, and the numbers down below are pounds of emissions to deliver one unit of heat, one mega, you know, one million B BTUs of heat. So this is how much um, you know, how, how many greenhouse gas emissions you'll, you'll put out for one unit of heat. And then on the right-hand side, um, you have two of them that are heat pumps, ground source and an air source. Um, and then the middle one's an electric. And electric is really bad. <laughs> There's so many reasons. with Electric resistance heating is just really bad. But right now, if you put in a cold climate air source heat pump, your pounds of emissions are going to be lower than if you were riding if you were using a high efficiency gas furnace. And that's because the electricity you, you, it, number one, the heat pump is a very very efficient um, product. Right. Um, but number two, you're already running it on carbon reduced electricity. So you know you have a certain percentage of renewable energy on the grid right now. And um, so if you put in that heat pump, if you insulated and weatherized your building so that you've driven your load down as much as possible. Right. And then you put the heat pump in, you're running off that. Now you're kind of trusting the state to actually clean up the grid. Um, that's a you know a graph showing a cleaning up the grid over time. By 2050, it's well on its way. The state's um, um, 2030 plan says that, um, uh, you know, the, that last little bit's gonna be made up with, um, carbon sequestration. But if we then get to the right-hand side of that line, um, it goes to this. You're now using that same system you have 
you know, the same building, the same investment you've already put in there, you've now gotten to 85% less greenhouse gas emissions. So you're kind of relying on the electric grid to actually do its part. Yeah, go ahead, Gail. You talk about uh, heat pumps. Are you including uh, mini splits? Uh, yeah, mini split is a heat pump. Okay. And because so you're not requiring duct work and all that stuff. Right, no. Okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I could see making some arguments for converting. We've got oil tank furnaces and yeah, it's nothing but problems. So the pitch would be to replace that heating with heat pumps. Yes. Yes. So, and I mean, go ahead. Okay, good. I was just saying, so if we did, just say we did um, the air source heat pumps, you know, and the, for, for residences, there's the subsidies that are, you know, the state subsidies. Do the municipalities get subsidies for that as well? Or is there a program to subsidize heat pumps? Yeah, no, it's the same. Uh, it's the same as a commercial, uh, mass save commercial. Um, really? Safe. Yep. Huh. Let's yep, jump. Yeah. On. Yeah. What is it at the moment? And they're actually changing. And I understand they're going to go up more. Um, but they, the mass save program is uh, every three years it gets updated. So it's it get, it's getting near the next update level. Um, but right now, I believe an air source heat pump is gets a thirty five hundred dollars per ton. It's always measured in tons of cooling. Mm -hmm. And a ground source heat pump or geothermal heat pump um, gets forty five hundred dollars per ton. Um, they're pretty strong subsidies. But, um, but geothermal requires duct work, right? No. Um, uh, so let me give you a quick description. Uh, what a heat pump does is it just moves heat from one space to another. Got it. Okay. You can either grab that heat from the air yep. or you can grab the heat from the ground. Correct. That's the air source or ground source. Right. And then how do you deliver that heat? You can deliver that heat by um, uh, bringing the, a coolant line in. Like it's basically uh, for heating, you, know, you can imagine taking the, the, all, all the coolant lines on the back of the refrigerator and pulling them out someplace and hooking them up to a radiator. <laughs> you know, and then... That's basically what it is. So you once you do, once you get that heat off of there, it's a low temperature heat. So it's a different than difference in your furnace, a low temperature heat. Then how you distribute that heat through the building depends a huge amount on the building um, and what you can do. If you've got furnaces already and you've got ductwork, then you might put in some kind of you know a fan coil unit where you're actually putting yeah. the heat into the right. ductwork. If you have a hydronic system. You know, you maybe you can use it, but you're you're gonna have to probably do something with your distribution system to make right. it work. Okay. Or it could be mini splits. A mini split is just one way of taking the coolant and then in, with no ducting whatsoever, just you know, tossing the heat into the room. So it's the distributor, not the Yep. Okay. Right. A mini split is just a distribution system. Okay. Yeah. That's well, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, helpful way to think alternatively about how we go forward um so i think that's good so i think we should probably wrap up and shift gears to our other stuff do other people have any okay. questions chris so chris i think what I, we'll do i mean we're going to meet with the select board next week just to clarify stuff and then i think we as a committee will figure out next steps in terms of a public hearing on the bylaw that we have to sort of um, put forth for town meeting and then figure out, you know, is there going to be a special town meeting in the fall? It sounds like there might be. Yep. Um, so I'll just, I can just keep you updated. And if we have any questions through that process, shoot your email or something. Sure. Um, but I, but we're all, we voted somewhere a couple of months ago that we wanted to go forward with this. So. Um, Excellent. Um, would it be helpful to talk to Ashfield who went off and oh. They passed everything they needed to in one town meeting. <laughs> they, they have, have bylaw language. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. If you can share the contact information, that'd be great. I remember yeah. reading about that and being envious. Right. Yeah, they had one big public hearing. 
that I presented at, and then they brought it all to town meeting and everything passed. So well, that, was excellent. that would be very helpful. Yep. We could repeat that nicely. Yeah, that would be great. Good suggestion. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you for all this information. You're welcome. But before Chris goes, um, you know, are we at a point where we do we need to work with the select board about uh, to have, you know, a presentation about, you know, uh, you know, like, could we work with Chris to try to schedule, you know, something, you know, that we could get it on to the, the fall town meeting, like if there's an emergency emergency town meeting, can we start that conversation now or is it we need to have it okay by the select board first? Well, or, next week's meeting with the select board is really going to be about two things. Um, one is getting there okay about the broker for CCA, but the more dynamic part is to clarify when we were created, you know, the charge was that we would be rec making recommendations to the select board. So at least my interpretation was that we were not, you know, we're, we're a freestanding committee in some regards, but we were not acting like other committees. Like we were making, we were bringing things to the select board, which is why with the opt-in stretch code, we were making a recommendation to the select board as opposed to sort of saying, we just want to bring it to the, you know, and get it on the warrant and more or less inform the select board. Um, so I think the, the this is sort of the next conversation I want to get into, but it's clarifying that, and I, my assumption is they'll be okay with it, but that, you know, we just started acting like every other committee. Um, so if we do our due diligence and do our homework, we can have a public hearing, we'll keep them informed, but, you know, we're, we're all growed up, so to speak. Um, so we can act independently, you know, in coordination with them, as opposed to asking them to act on our behalf, if that, if that makes sense. So once we clarify that next week, then we'll be able to figure out how do we schedule these things? And if we're doing, you know, if we want to be, over, you know, ambitious, like Chris was suggesting of like doing everything at once, you know, whether we could do it for a special town meeting, I'm sort of dubious, but we could plan for doing it for doing everything whole hog, or we could do the stretch code at special town meeting and then queue up everything else. So it's sort of, I think it's at that point, it would be up to us to decide what's our capacity and our timing as opposed to sort of figuring out what the select board thinks we should be doing, if that makes sense. And get that in the record. Yeah. So great. So that's what that's where we're at, Chris. So great. Okay. <laughs> that was helpful. Great. Yeah. I will well, thank you I'll again. Some information with you tomorrow and um please keep me informed. And I and I'm pretty sure actually the only the only thing that has to go to town meeting is a specialized stretch code. Okay. Yeah. If, if you can send them a presentation too, so we have that, that would be great. Yep. Okay. I'll do that too. Cool. Wonderful. Okie dokie. All right. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Have a great evening. You too. Yeah. So, any thoughts before we shift gears? That was very fruitful. Great. Great. Cool. So the next thing was actually the, this conversation just in preparation for the select board meeting, which is on the fourth, which I think is next Tuesday. Yeah. Um, and so did I what I what I just explained, was that clear or should I sort of restate it? Or is, uh, no, that's that's crystal clear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean I I think the fact that we didn't have a public hearing really was that I was assuming we were, we were bringing a recommendation and they would sort of look at it and do something, but you know, their bandwidth, they don't, they don't have any bandwidth. Um, so I think at this point we've demonstrated through, you know, different things that, you know, we're doing what our charge is. We, we're, we're doing research. We're sort of bringing things forward responsibly. I don't see there's any reason why they would not say, you know, just do what other committees do and let us know when we need to be notified about stuff. Um, and if, if we agree on that, then I think it's, it, it, it might not change the CCA broker thing, which they'll decide next week as well. But in terms of this, the whole climate leadership stuff, then we can have a conversation and say, what's our timing? What do we want to bundle? What's right. reasonable? And then we can call our own public meeting. Um, so... 
So, and I think for next week, I mean, I'll go, you know, I, oh, I should double check to make sure that I posted it. I'm not sure if I did, um, but I'll post it as a meeting so all four of us can show up, but we don't all have to show up. So if there's something else, but it is, Becky's going to do it at 6.15, um, which I know is a little bit tight. I think Isaac on your end. So just as an FYI. Yeah, I'll show, I'll show up. Right at 6.15, I might have to boogie if it's not done by 6.45. Oh, it, it'll be done by 6.45. Okay. They, they won't let us talk that long. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Your agendas are too full. Yeah, 6.15, yeah. Cool. Um, so I don't think there's anything more on that unless, you know, and I think with the CCA, they've got everything. I think, Nate, you'll probably be our point person on that, you know, I'm guessing they might ask questions that they've asked before, before they say go forward, but really yeah. we're just asking them to sort of allow us to go forward and sort right. of make that connection with Colonial and start the gears turning, um, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I would want to make sure that they have a copy of the recommendation letter that we put together and just make sure that that's in front of them uh, in advance of this meeting. And then, you know, I, I do still have questions about, um, with regard to the broker, um, you know, I I can interact with the broker, but I can't sign a contract for the town, right? So, you know, just to make sure that that's like very clear, um, you know, because this <laughs> this meeting is about like what the lines of responsibility and authority right. are. So, right. just making sure right. all of that is right. but, understood. The broker knows that. I mean, this yeah. is not the first town he's dealt with. <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the select board and Becky know that. I don't think they're going to yeah. yield signing contracts over to anybody. But it's good to get it in the record. This is how we see it. Are we clear? Yes. Yeah, because it's taken a while. Yeah. And yeah I Let just... us move. Yes, yeah. please. I'm, I mean, one because Becky can sign the contract on behalf of the town. So... As soon as the select board says yes, Becky can sign it, and then you're got approval to talk to them and sort of move forward with whatever we have to do. Um, yeah, so I think that I, I think this should be good. You know, it, I I'm not sure why it got lost. You know, in the lead up to town meeting, but um, I think we can get this signed off on and then just go forward. So, so what is the contract for that to hire them as the broker, right? Straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's boilerplate language, probably. Yeah. Okay. So I think for can I can I move to updates? Is that good? So I, some of these are pretty easy. So there were three things. There was this the letter for solar on the library. And I talked to Elaine and she was equally confused as to why we needed it. Um, so that's a non-issue there. It's built in. I Neither one of us could figure out why they needed a letter, but still check mark on that one. Um, the EV charger application, that was confusing um, because if you all remember, Eric had said that the offer was off the table and then yeah. Becky said it was on the table. I didn't bother checking up because of our conversation that it wasn't really a priority, but um, I don't know, does anyone have an update on that one? But I, I don't think it really it, matters to them. That was pretty much what Eric said too at the time, you know, given what we had discussed in the committee and, you know. Yeah, Eric, yeah, Eric praised you for making your those points. Um, and then it was sort of, you know, the, I think the only confusing point was Becky said, oh, it's not off the table. But I think it, it's, if there's any consideration, it's for the select board to figure out at this point. Yeah. Because um, there's. And, and know, it was big, big, other big stuff. bucks, major big bucks. Yeah. Right. Um, I think we, we were... ran the kind of the cost benefit analysis. Uh, you know, there, and we confirmed that there's interest from the school to have one there. But, right. um, you know, for short term parking at like Town Hall or the library, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing was the, um, I'm just looking this up because I didn't get it into my email. Uh, 
Darcy Dumont from the, the Amherst Pelham Northampton CCA sent out um, an email on Thursday because um, they're launching the Valley Green Energy CCA. I uh, got approved by DPU last month, so um, in April, and they're scheduled to launch in September 2024. So it's mostly just an update that after lots of planning, they're going to go. They're going to go live. So, you know, what we talked about is we wanted to let them get their legs under them and operate for a while before we considered yeah. doing anything. So, you know, they'll they'll start in September and we can start tracking them. So, that'll that'll be good. Yeah. I think also it'd be good to know like what would be a timeline when we could hitch ourselves to their wagon, right? Because it would only be when they're renegotiating a contract and that like we don't really know the terms of their contract yet. So well, I don't know. I mean, I think they could pull us in probably it, you know, it, it I mean, if we're adding to their demand, I'm sure they're, you know, their brokers probably would be I don't know, it depends on what the contract is written as, right? Um yeah. So I think it's, I mean, my initial thought was they probably don't want to invite new partners until they figured out how they're going to operate. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that internal thing first. Yeah, um, but yeah, your point is well taken. Like we don't know, we don't have a sense of timing for when we could even join. Um, so but I, think, I, I think like kind of making the point that like, if we had a general time, like if we knew that in three years we could hitch ourselves to their wagon, you know, we might not want to make a five-year contract or an eight-year right. contract. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, Nick, do you get a sense? I mean, is there a norm for the contract lengths given that the market's so volatile? Well, that feeds directly into um, your broker's um, due diligence and guidance into the, the length of the contract that you that you sign into, right? So, you know, if, if there's a reasonable expectation that once, uh, I don't know, turmoil in Ukraine, you know, works its way through the system, um, you know, th that would be a time when they, they should recommend a short contract. Uh, but if you've, as some, as some towns did, uh, enter into contracts when, electricity prices were dirt cheap, you know, then, well, you want to lock that in for a yeah. longer period of time. So yeah. that I, hopefully would be part of their guidance. Right. Uh, us, I think. Cool. Um, I have one other, one other updated thing, and then I don't know if you all do, but I'm realizing, so it's almost June and we all get re-upped for July 1st. So can I assume that all of you want to be continuing on with ECAC so I can tell the select board to reappoint us all? Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. That's good. And eventually, maybe we'll find two or other people who want to play with us. So, you know, if, if you run into anyone, I mean, I think it's, it's a rolling situation, but if we can put, you know, get things in the hopper and sort of talk to people, it's always a good thing. Um, but I will thank you all for being willing to keep going. Um, so that's good. Um, any other updates you all have? Was there any, any more information on that? I remember the last meeting we talked about what was that uh, pickup truck that uh, I think it was the library was going to get a pickup truck, an electric pickup truck that could service as a generator, like an on the, oh. on the spot generator. No information. Okay. I don't. I remember having that conversation. I haven't heard any. That was part of the the Becky letter. Yes. You know, but it was yeah. like it was just a sentence. Right. Right. That's educational for us to learn that there was such a thing. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's for yeah. the, the like the rehashing of the conversation of the electric buses and how those could also serve as a, a generator, like a school electric school bus could serve as a mobile generator for like right. the town hall or whatever, you know, like around camp, around uh, the town, so. You know, one thing that's interesting, uh, just to sort of loop back in terms of the climate leadership is, I, I, I feel like this came up at town meeting with the police chief because she was 
like two years ago, she she was supportive of electric vehicle, even though we approved a hybrid. And I think what she reported this year was that police departments across the state were finding that there was problems with the electric. So like, you know, if if depending on what the specifics are in terms of climate leadership and what the commitment is in terms of your your fleet, that you know, it could be a state wanting to do something versus experiential at the municipal level that could be problematic. I think we've we've kind of trodden this this trail before, and I think Nate, I saw your hand raised, but it was there are exemptions for emergency vehicles and stuff like that, and certain size of vehicles, like we wouldn't have to get an electric fire truck, that right. kind of stuff. But I'm not sure about emergency response vehicles uh, okay. pertaining to the police. So I, I would also like to see for a technology that is um, well understood to require less maintenance than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, I'd like to see the documentation for this assertion, honestly, um, and not just vibes, if you will. I'm not saying there aren't issues, but, um, I, you know, I withhold an opinion until I actually see documentation from police departments across the country that electric vehicles are causing all kinds of problems. That sounds good. Gail. Yeah. Didn't it have to do with the things that are required in a police vehicle that were somehow in competition with or contradicted the the electric well, setup? The, 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 you mean the draw on the battery kind of with all their internal I don't computers know, I don't know and stuff? I what, what it was, but that there are certain requirements to be a police vehicle. It has to have blah, 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 blah. That's right. that augured against EV or the, it was competitive or didn't work together well or something like that i'm sure there are a a, a narrower range of makes and models that can be configured to meet those requirements i'm, I'm sure of that because there are um you know, as you say uh it has to be tricked out um to, to you know to to fulfill the requirements of right. of an officer's you know duty so yeah. i totally get that but yeah. that should, but you're right. I mean, that should be nationwide. It should be not an idiosyncratic in one town. Yeah. Well, I think when we, I mean, if we go down the path of the climate leadership thing, we're going to bump into this conversation and then we can have yeah. a, you know, a real conversation and yeah. we'll, we can get beyond vibes so that Nate's happy. <laughs> <laughs> I just see a, a, a t shirt. Don't give me vibes. <laughs> So, um, so I think the only thing I got is minutes for our next item. Is that is that good with you all, Gail? Uh, I got no comments on the minutes, so um, I would. Um, is it appropriate now to move the beaks? Yeah, I move that the minutes of April twenty third, twenty twenty four, be approved as submitted. I'll second. Great. Any comments? Okay. Hearing none, we shall vote. Gail, how do you vote? Oh, yes. Nate. Aye. Isaac. Aye. And I am an aye. Okay. Minutes are unanimously approved. Cool. Okay. I'll so, send them. There seems to be some hiccup at town hall in getting minutes posted. Can you do that? Not not appropriate. I mean, I know how, but that's not, you know. Mm, so now okay. that the election's over, that should make time more available for both the clerk and the assistant clerk. But it's not just our committee; other committees okay. are also. Good to know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I added just future topics because it seems like that's a good thing to be forward thinking. So it was prompted by the fact that I'm still supposed to do the non fossil fuel procurement policy, which I've done nothing on. So I put that on for a future meeting, but is there any other future topics that you guys want to make sure we start thinking about that is not obvious, like the climate leadership stuff? Uh, maybe just as a as an idea, um, that procurement policy seems like the kind of thing that you might fold into the climate leaders plan. Like oh, you might dovetail. You could do it independently for sure, but um, you know, there's like. It seems like we're being prompted to take that larger frame 
and maybe that could be part of it. You know, the it is one of the check boxes here, the ZEV first. Um, but you know, then extending that into recommendations, you know, heat pump first or you know. That actually, you know, that just reminds me. I mean, the, the heat pump conversation would be interesting since we've talked about solar a lot. It'd be interesting to talk about, you know, and it seems it's never too early to talk about the budget, you know. I mean, if we wanted to get in front of capital planning and actually come up with recommendations to start moving towards heat pumps, this would be this time to do it. So right. um, we could maybe... I think what we might do is look at the, the five buildings, see what the heat system is now. Um, I guess capital planning and building committee would have to tell us if heat pumps would be even feasible, feasible in those various buildings. They, there, I know that many splits have been added at town hall, but the school, for instance, how oh my goodness, how would you? That furnace has been a problem forever, and it would be nice just to let it go and install heat pumps everywhere, but. Practically speaking, how do you do that? Well, I think also just kind of going off of that, you know, I think that it's kind of a chicken egg situation, right? So we want to lower, you know, we're we're counting on in 2050 electrical be like the electricity grid being more clean. Um, but in the calculations that you made that would bring us to net zero for, um, you know, photovoltaic on roofs in town, that's probably not factoring in the switch over to heat pumps, uh, which would be mainly electric run, right? right? So we would be divesting the cost of, you know, propane or oil on site in these municipal municipal buildings, but how much more expensive or less expensive would it be budgetarily speaking for that? And if can we make an argument based on that? Hmm. Well, here's a question, I guess. I mean, if we have this as a more robust conversation next time, it seems like it seems prudent for us to talk amongst ourselves and then invite the building committee um, to join us, but like not at the first meeting because that right. will probably look too disorganized. Is that a correct assumption? I think we should know what we're talking about or asking about. Really? Yes, exactly. <laughs> a good general strategy. What I a think. concept. <laughs> Yeah, I just wonder if there's a calculator out there, right, that you, we could say, hey, we use, you know, 500 gallons of propane a year to heat this building. How, like, if we, how many mini splits would that entail? And, like, given a, a you know, an energy, energy cost of 13, an average of 14 or 15 cents per kilowatt hour, what would that cost, you know? Like, I, I would be surprised, like, with all this movement towards electric, that there aren't those resources. And maybe that's something that Chris might know about or, you know, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe one of you guys know. We, we can get yeah. the current costs easily enough from Mass Energy Insight, yeah. but from what Chris said, every building is gonna have its own- Yeah, idiosyncrasies. Constraints. Yeah, idiosyncrasies too. It's not like you can just make a blanket assertion that it's gonna- I mean, but it's but it's kind of like a miles per gallon thing, right? Like, is there like a, a quasi reliable, like, you know, if we know X number, I'm not talking about like, you know, like, let's talk about kilowatts and let's talk about gallons of fuel. Like, let's put aside how much each individual gallon or kilowatt costs, but like general usage, right? So like, there's some sort of conversion that 500 gallons of of oil would you know convert to you know like one kilowatt or one megawatt you know right. of electricity Question. so that way we can factor that into the 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 um you know the net zero calculations right. moving forward because it seems like the you know i don't know depending on how things go with the building committee about like the viability of the structural integrity of the roofs in town um you know, it'll probably be heat pumps might be 
more accessible before yep. a you know a, a, a PV array on on the buildings. Or it might be a combination. Yeah, right, right, right. But then our needs will shift, right? Our electrical needs will shift yep. based on the switch. So yeah, I think it'd be a good conversation for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm going to put it on our agenda for next time, which I should let's just check before you adjourn. Um, Yeah, next our, our next real meeting. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's if we've got one on the books yet. Um, probably, I mean, so we could do the 18th or the 25th, I think, or the two viable times. So if we're meeting on the 4th, maybe the 25th is better, but do you guys have anything uh, going on? I'm out of town on the 25th, okay. but the 18th, I don't have anything right now. Okay, Nate, Gail, I'm good. 18th. Um, both are good. Oh, good. Cool. Okay. So one, I'll just I'll set it up. We'll plan on the 18th at our usual five o'clock time, just because it's working well. Um, and then okay, and for. And I'll see you guys on the fourth um, for the conversation with the select board next week. Um, so, um, what do you want somebody to do at all board meeting? Oh yes, thank you, thank you. I knew there was, you know, there was. I mean, I'll I'll really be there for the web that. committee, but I don't know what you want to represent ECAC. Um. I feel like I don't know enough about this committee to represent it well, frankly. Oh, you jest. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> you know as much as anybody. I think what I, you know, so I don't know, you know, some sometimes when all board meetings are called, it's to actually have this select board convey stuff. So everyone has this, you know, there's as many years as possible. I don't know if that's actually on their agenda, if they're trying to coordinate. Um, I think the thing that I personally, what I would want to convey is that the things we're looking forward to. So, you know, the CCA, I think we can talk about that we're thinking about climate leadership and what that means, um, because we might as well, you know, project that out for people who are thinking about. It. And I think in the meeting, we could just say there's a couple of committees that we're going to want to be working with. To think this through, you know, ah. so we're, we're going to want to talk to the buildings community. Bring this up as a, oh, excellent. Yeah. You know, um, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can actually get to the police car stuff through capital planning because every vehicle has to go through capital planning as well. Um, so that's, I think that's mostly it to just sort of let them know what we're thinking. Um, and then we want to, you know, we're needing to play with each other a little bit. And then um, bring back whatever they say to the committee. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And that would be great. Um, Nate, it sounds like you'd have a hard time getting there. Yeah, I'm trying to know what I have to see. Building the and wives and all that good stuff. You know, what was time? time. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm actually doing something fun. I'm going to see music, which I never go see. So it's like I bought those tickets two months ago. I have to actually follow through. So. So while you're at an all boards meeting, I'll be doing something that's, you know, personally fulfilling. Oh, Robbie. Nice. <laughs> but I appreciate I appreciate you going. Um, so anyone want to move to adjourn? Uh, I'd like to move to adjourn the meeting. Anyone second. A second? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, Gail. How do you vote? Aye. Nate. Aye. Isaac. Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Have a delightful evening. See you next week. See you Tuesday. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.